624 deaths and of importance is for us to note that the out of this 1,672 have happened in the last two months. And also to note is that this could be an underestimation given the reporting of deaths in this country. We also look at the expected growth of numbers. We expect to reach our peak this month or next month. On average, we get 1,000 cases per day, and this number is expected to peak if we do not do um, observe the SOPs. And this uh, trajectory is what informed the lockdown, and therefore, uh, during this lockdown, we need to adhere to the SOPs if um, the course of this uh, epidemic is to be reversed. Thank you very much. Now let's get to our core, which is the vaccination. Globally, we've had over 3 billion doses that have been administered into people's arms. And 80% of these have just been given in only 10 countries. And even to bring it more closer, 62, the high income countries have administered 62 times more vaccines than we have given on the African continent. All of all the six, or over uh, three billion doses in Africa, now we have just about 1% of these doses administered in our continent. We only have, of the 1.3 billion people on the African country, continent, only 15 million have been fully vaccinated. You can imagine, with all the myths and misconceptions all around this vaccine, we are just having a drop of these vaccines, but even with the little that we have, we are still having many educated people talking about the vaccine in a way that they are even discouraging those who have, who could get a chance to get it, not to get it. We have countries like the UK that 48% of the population is now fully vaccinated. These are the people who manufacture the AstraZeneca. Now, before we even get to AstraZeneca, let me get back to you, Dr. Driwali, to take us through where are we standing now as Uganda when it comes to the COVID vaccination. Uh, as far as COVID vaccination is concerned, as we have repeatedly said, the discussions around the vaccines seem to overshadow the disease itself. And... Um, the, and, and the real conversation for us rotates around the scarcity of vaccines for people, people who need it badly. Uh, first of all, um, to date, we have received a total of 1.1 million doses. And out of these, 861,000 have been given as first doses and 129,000 have been given a second doses. So that represents the number of people who are fully vaccinated. And um, uh, if you look at the percentage of the Ugandan population which is vaccinated so far, this represents 0.43% compared to 0.78% for Africa. And also looking at um, out of the total number of people we expect to be vaccinated, we have just vaccinated, uh, we have just vaccinated 4.2% of our target population. And the priority group as a matter of agency were to vaccinate is about 5 million we have just vaccinated 18%. So these figures are very, very, very low. And the journey which is left for us to reach critical mass of people vaccinated is very long. Thank you very much. One of the things you mentioned is priority groups. So let's now get to how did we select priority groups? Why do we even have priority groups, especially now that we see 
We used to say that children are not getting really infected or they are getting infected and not, and not getting severe disease. Why do we have priority groups? Now, um, generally for control of diseases, we have priority groups set based on vulnerability. So which groups are those, which groups of people are those who are most affected? If it is measles, we say children. If it is meningitis, we say below 30 years. If it is yellow fever, we say below 60 years. Now, in addition to this targeting by vulnerability for vaccine preventable diseases, COVID has come with another dimension. In addition to vulnerability for severe disease and death, there is also the issue of vaccine availability so that the few doses of vaccines you have you would want to use them to protect the people who are at the highest risk of death and severe disease so that those who can fight off the disease on their own which fortunately is about 80 percent of the people who are infected their vaccination can be delayed if they are in the category which is likely to be asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. So therefore we prioritize because of vulnerability for severe disease and death. We also prioritize so that the few doses which we get give us the maximum benefit by targeting those who are at the highest risk. Now there are also knock-on effects. If you target people who are at the highest risk of severe disease and they will require to be hospitalized, then you are also preventing congestion in your hospital uh, places. And the shortage of oxygen, which we are now all familiar with, the way to solve it is to select those who are likely to get severe disease and will require uh, to, uh, to be put on oxygen. If you vaccinate them and you prevent that severe form of disease, then you create a space which, in, which may even not be there in, in most cases in the hospitals. In short, we, we, we help our health system to, to handle because right now we are really devastated and even people with other diseases and the other diseases have not stopped. COVID has not stopped malaria, it has not stopped mosquitoes from flying around. It has not stopped HIV, it has not stopped all these other diabetes and they are still going on. So we still need to have our health system intact to be able to manage all the other cases. COVID is just an add-on. The reproductive health complications will still be there. So if we vaccinate and decongest the hospitals, we also protect ourselves from as health workers from burnout. Exactly. High burden, high workload, is very um, devastating for the healthcare workers so that because they will burn out, they fail to concentrate, they get infected themselves, they may not be very professional. So there are many, many other knock-on effects which come as a result of overwhelmed health system by numbers of people who are infected. I've recently been to hospitals. I've not been to hospitals for a long time here in Uganda, but I can tell you right now that it is very, very devastating to go to a hospital. Even when you have all the money that you, have, you can have in this world, it is very, very serious that you, will not, you may not get a bed, especially if you progress to severe disease and need an ICU bed. You, will not, you may get the ICU bed, but the oxygen shortage is real. So in short, the vaccine is supposed to save us from getting to that level. We don't, and remember that COVID also has its long COVID. You can get out of hospital, but the side effects it leaves. So as we get into our break right now, uh, Dr. Driwale, I would like you to tell our viewers, how are we getting vaccines into the country? From where? The vaccines we are getting into the country are through a number of channels. There is the COVAX facility, which is a global arrangement to secure vaccines uh, through pooling resources and distributing it fairly to the, those who need it. The second is through our bilateral arrangements. 
As a country, we are opening mechanisms to purchase vaccines directly. One is through the new avenue which COVAX facility has provided. The second is through the African Union. And the third is uh, where Uganda goes out of its way and establishes links with the particular countries. And the fourth are our friendly countries which donate to us vaccines. So these are the various routes and we're exploring all these channels to ensure that we get the doses we need. Okay, thank you very much. We now get into our break. Remember to follow us on our social media handles on Twitter and on Facebook and on YouTube, The Doc Talk Show. You are watching The Doc Talk Show. Patriotism is a feeling of love, devotion, and the willingness to sacrifice for one's country. I say no to corruption because I put my country first. I choose peace over violence because I put my country first. <laughs> Uganda first. This message is brought to you by the National Secretariat for Patriotism Co Uganda, Office of the President. We've cut and reduced our MTN Momo withdrawal rates. Now you can withdraw mobile money at the lowest rates. You also get MTN Central Points when you deposit, send, and withdraw MTN mobile money. Visit our Momo agents countrywide and withdraw mobile money at our reduced rates from 1st May 2021. Everywhere you go, MTN. Uganda first. Patriotism program in secondary schools was launched in 2009 by His Excellency the President of the Republic of Uganda, General Yuri Kapitam Seveni, and he was focusing on secondary schools to make sure that uh, we develop uh, a generation uh, among the youth that is patriotic and is ready to serve and to sacrifice for their country. Good enough, the president had a policy document. He, he, he went around, he met teachers. So when he appointed me to be in charge of the, the secretariat, the work was clear. Ensure you bring the teachers on board because they are the ones who ordinarily most of the time are with the young people. As a patriot, I joined the Patriotic Club in 2018 when I had just joined the mighty college, Trinity College, Nabingo. And each of us that joined that year, we had to undergo that exercise. I learned a lot of things because I was also given the responsibility to lead the parade by then. As young as I was, we were with, we were with Form 1s and Form 5s, but I made an effort to take it through. There are some core values that we cherish as a country. Okay. Mm? The core values, hard work, mm? the core values of time management, do you respect the environment? Integrity. Are you united as a community or you are promoting those divisions that we don't encourage? One of the values of patriotism is love, sacrifice, obedience, and very many things we do for our country. Patriotism taught me to be a responsible person, someone that carries myself with integrity, with pride of who I am motivates you, it teaches you to learn, to love anything surrounding you. Uganda is not just a name. I've learned many values from it and one of them is love, there is discipline, respect, hard work and keeping time. I have learned virtues of love, respect, integrity and we are loving one another. Are you clean? Do you encourage your people to remain clean? Yes, Are you responsible? Do you respect public property? Mm -hmm. Do you respect yourself as a human being? Sure. In the offices where you are, is there integrity mm -hmm. at your workplace? Are you honest enough? All those are core values of patriotism. The best things that I learned are at the end of it all, when you're patriotic, you can become successful and you can prosper in life. These virtues have helped me in my roles of leadership. Before joining patriotism, 
I didn't have love for the nation. I didn't have love for my country, Uganda. But then, after becoming a patriot, I love Uganda. I love others and myself. Be patriotic, Uganda first. <laughs> this message is brought to you by the National Secretariat for Patriotism Co. Uganda, Office of the President. You are watching the Dog Talk Show. Welcome back to the Doc Talk Show, where we are discussing COVID-19 vaccination uh, in Uganda. And with me is Dr. Alfred Riwale, again, our program manager for vaccination and immunization in Uganda, and, and Dr. Fiona Tewe, your host and a vaccinologist. So, Dr. Driwale, I think it's very important that we address all this misinformation that is running around on social media. And by the way, most of it, if you look at, I've seen lots of videos that people send to me, like 100 in a day, for me to validate. But if you realize that most of these videos are actually from the global north, from the US or from Europe, some from, a few from Asia now, but you will rarely find those from Africa. But our job is now to keep forwarding and forwarding and, you know, you wonder if in Africa we can't do our own videos if they were there. But it also reminds me of the MR campaign that we had just a few years ago where even a vaccine that was known to people brought hula balloon. The HPV vaccine for girls uh, to prevent them against cervical cancer has also generated, I think it generated much more controversy than the COVID vaccine. So in short, I think we shall get through this and be able to vaccinate our people. I, I think, uh, Dr. Fiona, it is normal for people to be skeptical of any medical product or any intervention. This is a normal reaction. If something is new, you do not know how it works. And made worse by people who fabricate stories uh, around the intervention to an extent that you forget why the intervention came in the first place. It is about the disease. Now, the story we are all about is the intervention. The mask is not good. The vaccine is not good. We cannot social distance, and so on. So these become disruptive uh, discussions. But there are people who genuinely receive this information and want more information in order to make informed decisions about these interventions. And I can see progressively, more and more people are getting information and you can see the demand for vaccines it continues to increase amidst all this. When we vaccinated 2019 against the measles and rubella outbreak, the numbers of cases, the numbers of deaths were high. But as I speak now, as I follow on, measles is not a disease we're worried about. Rubella is not a disease we're worried about, and that's why we now encourage the public to continue with the routine immunization against these conditions, in spite of the bad image, bad stories which were flowing around, uh, around these vaccines. And COVID vaccines are just one of them, and we are here to clarify it to the public so that they gain confidence and take up these interventions which other parts of the world are uh, benefiting from and where they are opening up their society, they are returning to normal life, the economies are beginning to thrive. They are watching football. And, they are watching football. <laughs> and we are still in our houses now. People can't even go to bars to watch football with their friends. So I think it's important at least for football fans to, to be able to, to get vaccinated and be able to go and watch uh, their fellow people. So now let's get to the controversies and misinformation that comes about the content of the vaccine. The fact that it is able to make genetic changes, it has microchips, it has this magnet. I don't know if Dr. Duale, you've seen the, the, the video on electricity. I've seen the video on electricity. I've seen, I've seen the video on magnets. I've seen the, the, the big statements by one, Ameri uh, one president who said uh, the vaccine will make the skin of ladies to become like the one of crocodile. So all these, and I've also heard about uh, 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 videos which, which say you will be important, you will not produce, but what you can see 
clearly with all these pieces of information is they are meant to scare. If your skin is going to change like that of a crocodile, if you are not going to, um, uh, if you are going to have impotence, if you are not going to have a child, if you are, your body is going to be like a magnet and you are going to produce electricity during sh uh, 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 electricity blackout. Neighbors will be calling you when is off. Now, these are very scary because electricity itself shocks people. <laughs> Now, when vaccine gives you electricity, then it concerns. So these are antiques meant to scare people. And I think uh, as a vaccinologist, I will require that you clarify some of these to the people yourself. Okay, thank you very much. What I will do myself is to try and, uh, and use this. This is a metal. This is a pin that uh, that that really it is metal i'm sure everyone can see that this is a piece of metal which is close to the key and uh, only that it cannot light but if the lights go off as we we do this experiment maybe we shall see if i can turn on the lights and and you know and get back to to business so i'll try to to see if this i was vaccinated by the way i got my two doses i got them on my left arm but I also tried to see this on my left and right arm. I actually came dressed this way for that purpose to see if actually my body has suddenly become uh, magnetic. magnetic on the side where I've been vaccinated or, or not. Okay, let us see. So here I am with my pin, which is also stuck mm. on the right arm. And Dr. Driwale, you'll have to explain to people why me who is fully vaccinated, I'm now starting to become magnetic. Mm -hmm. So here it is. And then I've seen people doing this and off it falls. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then put it on, uh, on my side that was vaccinated. Dr. Driwale, if this pin doesn't fall off, mm -hmm. I don't know. So here it is. <laughs> <laughs> and it has also fallen off. I was afraid it could also get stuck. And, and for life, I'm moving around with a pin on my body. So... So let us try to explain to people why this, this does happen. So the claims of uh, electricity uh, and magnetism in, in people, we just need to understand that from our basic knowledge of how the cells in the body work, there is some form of electricity in a person, except that the amounts of that electricity are so small that they cannot light this. The, what keeps your heart beating is an electric activity. What keeps your mind to think, to talk, to coordinate is an electric activity. But that electric activity is not big enough to light a bulb. So it is meant to scare you. The second one is uh, there is what we used to call um, uh, static static uh, electricity. This one where we touch cars and... You and touch cars when you are opening a, a, a tap, door, it sparks your hands. When you, you touch a tap with yes. water, some people actually, you touch you each touch other the, and then you, and feel, then you a, feel a sparking. Yes. Or when you have a nylon shirt, when you are moving it, you hear... Uh -huh. Those kinds of electricities exist and also they make particles to stick. So, the explanations around th things sticking on the body could be because of the, can be explained in, in forms of the electrostatics, uh, which we all know. Now, the, the, if you see the articles, the, the articles we have put here to stick, it is very small and it was able to fall. What about these big ones? Did they put a glue? So those are questions which we cannot ask because the video recorder has no address. He has, he has no telephone number. You cannot interrogate him. Now, when you ask the questions, you're asking the wrong people. You are now asking the questions to attack your program here. Mm -hmm. But the person to be asked is the one who recorded it. But he's not there. Maybe he's a hunter. Maybe he's a farmer who has nothing to do with the vaccines. And also beware that there is an organized group of people who do not like normal 
uh, scientific progress. They are financed to record and distribute, to influence people in a way that they run away from vaccines, as we saw with the measles rubella, and, um, and they, they are doing the same to scare you from uh, vaccines which are already saving the Western world. Such people at best are bent on actions which will make us run away from the vaccine and remain in situations which we are. Exactly. And, and see where we are right now. The vaccination in... A, at, imagine if this vaccine had started in Africa. You can imagine. I don't think anyone would be vaccinated. But even when it has started in the Western world, with almost all the billion, three billion doses have been delivered there, we still have people here who are saying that we shouldn't have the vaccine. Imagine if it was to start here. We are glad it even started there. But I think it's important for people to understand this. Now, the other thing that is happening is what we are calling breakthrough infections, where someone has been vaccinated with one or two doses and still gets infected with COVID. This is a question that is coming up and up. You, you find somebody has one, maybe a grandparent or their parent, who got a COVID vaccine, one shot, and then with this new wave has had an infection and actually gotten sick, gone to hospital and actually died. But you know what they write on WhatsApp? I have seen 20 people in my village who were all vaccinated. They actually all got sick in the next two days and they've all died. That is how now social media works. And this will be now forwarded all over the place. So what we'd like now to talk about is those breakthrough infections. Breakthrough infections are defined as infections if somebody has had their two doses of a COVID vaccine and 14 up to 21 days later, within two to three weeks after the second uh, dose, gets a symptomatic infection. Now, we call that a breakthrough infection. There are many people who have been vaccinated with one or two doses and have had infection and we don't even know them. But then this takes us to now actually what is the vaccine meant to do? Now, from the, from the outset, we said these vaccines will not prevent uh, infection. The virus will find its way into you. But what the vaccines do is they prepare your body to fight and suppress those numbers of viruses to so low to an extent that it cannot in inflict severe damage on your organs to, real to, to progress to severe disease and to death. So the vaccine prepares your body to fight off that infection. Now, if it keeps the numbers low, you who were, who were supposed to have symptoms may now be without symptoms. You who were supposed to progress to hospitalization may only have mild symptoms. And indeed, for us, what we have seen is that most of our colleagues who are vaccinated and who got infected have remained with the mild symptoms or without any symptom at all. Which is what we wanted the vaccine to do. We shall now go on break, and when we come back from the break, we shall discuss why would someone actually be fully vaccinated and still get infection, severe disease, and die. You are watching The Dog Talk Show. Did you know that the filing and payment of final income tax by both individuals and non-individuals are due by 30th June 2021? We know most of us are working from home. URA is here to help you throughout this process. Contact us on 0800-117-000 or 0800-217-000 or email services at ura.go.ug. Uganda Revenue Authority. Developing Uganda together. You are watching the Dark Talk Show. Welcome back from the break. And uh, before we broke off, we're talking about people who have been vaccinated either with one dose or with two doses and still do get severe infections or get hospitalized or even die. So, Dr. Driwali, what happens? You had the, your first people vaccinated uh, mid-March 
And now we are in the second wave, which started towards the end of May and has led into June. But we are having people who say they were vaccinated, but are still in hospital and sick and are dying. Right. Um, Dr. Fiona, the issue, the question of have people who have been vaccinated died? This is not the issue of contention because we know there are people who were vaccinated and they got infected, they developed severe disease and died. This is true. Now, what is meaning for us is to understand that the vaccination we are offering is not against the all diseases. And to say the worst is not a vaccination against the death. So it doesn't prevent uh, the malaria, it doesn't lower blood sugar, it doesn't prevent hypertension. It... So you will expect that people who are going to die because of other conditions anyway would still die even if they are vaccinated. So, so in short, we are not going to have a period in Uganda where there is nobody dying because we are vaccinated. Exactly. So now let's go to the facts. There are people who, when you, when you get uh, vaccines, the vaccines take 14 days to 21 for it to have effect to protect you, which means if by the time you are vaccinated, you were already infected and maybe at that point without symptoms, this vaccination cannot change the course of that infective process. Or if you get infected soon after the vaccination and you get a good infective dose with the also underlying issues within you, the disease will still progress. So, so this is one aspect, and it is for this reason that we say, once you are vaccinated, do not think you are now protected. You must continue with the SOPs, including wearing of a mask. That is one area. Number two, the manufacturer of the vaccine in use here says, you are fully vaccinated two weeks after the second dose. So if someone gets one dose, he is partially protected. And that means he does not benefit from the, full benef the benefits of full vaccination. So it is possible for someone to get infected and for the disease to progress. Number three, remember the people we are targeting for vaccination now are people who are vulnerable anyway. Mm -hmm. They either had heart disease, a liver disease, they had cancer, yeah. they had diabetes, uh, and so on. High blood pressure, obese. obese, and so on. So these risks with the pa on partial protection can still progress to having that uh, severe form of disease, let alone the fact that no vaccine is 100% protective. So there are people who will still fall through the cracks and get the, the, the infection, the severe forms. But what is important is for us to ask the question, what are we comparing with? Mm -hmm. Because this narrative is, uh, is, is a singular, one way. is one way. You should be comparing the people who have been vaccinated exactly. and have got those experiences with another group of people who are not vaccinated at all. And then count the deaths at the end. Exactly. Put 100 people who are similar on this side who are not vaccinated, put another 100 of this side with the same risks who are vaccinated, then watch them at the end um, of uh, maybe a month or two or one year and see outcomes. Which group will lose more people? So what we are saying is this group which is not vaccinated will lose okay. more people than this. In fact, they will get, we shall get more very sick people who yes. end up going to hospital and then 
yes. finally die. So, in that group, which is so at the person. end of the day, we should not look at this one person who, for example, is diabetic. And also remember now we've had this issue of self-medication at home. When someone tests positive, people are taking steroids at home. People are walking to pharmacies and buying steroids. Now you have dexamethasone, which will raise your blood sugar, even when you are not diabetic but you are now vaccinated. Now, you have introduced a different parameter. It is not about the vaccine now. You're dealing with blood sugar that is uncontrolled, which will just damage your organ. Even steroids in their own right, they suppress your immunity. Steroids suppress your immunity. So you become more vulnerable, vulnerable. to severe disease. So you are challenging your body from the benefits of the vaccine which you have actually, which was supposed to protect you. So the, I think the issue here is the observations which we are making are right, but the assertion that the deaths are because of the vaccines is wrong, and it is what needs to be put to a scientific test. But also, by the virtue that we are able to see both those who have vaccinated and those who have not, we can authoritatively also say that the outcomes are worse for the group which is not vaccinated at all. Thank you very much. And now this brings me to those people who will tell you that if you have a symptomatic COVID and you get vaccinated, you better have a will because you're going to die immediately. <laughs> but, and now this has led to actually health workers. I, this one I've confirmed, but it is health workers telling the public that you need to get tested before getting vaccinated. Now, again, um, uh, the health workers have different competencies and they have different routines. If your daily routine is to work on the teeth, probably you are not the best suited to give advice on public health matters concerning COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Just like you can't ask, I'm sure Dr. Riwale right now, if I got a, a, a blood clot uh, right now in my lungs, I don't think you're the first person I'll go to, to to deal with my pulmonary embolism. Precisely. I would say this is a problem that requires a person who is better suited to do it. Exactly. I refer. So the explanations from some of the healthcare workers are also uh, uh, tagged to their limited limitations. Now, let me put this record straight. Testing before vaccination is not required. Exactly. It is not necessary to test you to know whether you have COVID or not, and then make a decision whether you should be vaccinated or not. But let's also first get back to childhood diseases. If we were to test every child for polio, for measles, for meningitis, for cholera, all these vaccines that we give. Imagine the testing that would go on. So the population should know. Even with, with all, remember when you take your babies for vaccination, we never take their blood to start checking for these diseases before vaccinating. So just like any other vaccine, this is not a requirement. It's not a requirement. And um, the other issue, which uh, I just want to put in a small print, is if you have, because vaccines are a preventive intervention. So by the time you want to vaccinate, if you are having symptoms, which are similar to that of COVID, right? It may make sense for you to have yourself tested because you are sick. Mm -hmm. Now, it is not because you are going to be vaccinated. It's because you are sick. So that once you are confirmed to be having COVID, then you go into care mm -hmm. as opposed to vaccination. vaccination. So that is the only time where a consideration for, vac for testing is, and it is not for vaccination, but it is also for you to know that you are sick and you need to be looked after in a certain way. And it also protects, it clears the confusion whether it is a vaccine which killed you or not, because you can get your sickness and progress and die, then the story at the funeral is, you he know, got, he, got, a, he got, got the vaccine, vaccine and that's why he died. 
while what actually killed you was a pre-existing infection of COVID-19, which was mismanaged. Yeah, true. Because the vaccine we have is not like the anti-rabies vaccine. Or measles. Or, or measles something. This is, this is not a therapeutic vaccine. This is a vaccine which prevents the disease, doesn't treat the disease. So once you are sick, seek care, not vaccine vaccination. And we have also realized that the, some of the claims people make about deaths, when you do, we, we send information to all districts that anybody who dies after vaccination should be taken for post-mortem because it is a standard practice we do as part of the investigations for adverse events following immunization. A number of such people where investigations are being done have shown that these are people who are having pre-existing pre conditions. conditions. You open the person, the lungs, and he's living, he has been living on one lung. Mm -hmm. You open the person, the person has been living on a quarter of his heart, and so on and so on. So, and you cannot attribute that to, to the vaccine, but you attribute it to the pre-existing condition. So to do the same for COVID-19, infections you need to be diagnosed so that you are treated not to be vaccinated thank you very much for explaining that because it also reminds me of the people who turn covid positive soon after they receive the vaccine then someone says i received the vaccine two days ago now i can't breathe i can't go up the stairs now i and because because we, I know I, this happened and I had friends who had that. I, the first person to call is you and tell you. And the first thing which was at the beginning of this wave is because we are now currently going up with a wave where most people, actually many people, not most people, many people are infected. There are chances that you got your vaccine, but you were already infected. So what you're manifesting are actually signs and symptoms of the COVID disease. But many people will say, I got it, I got the vaccine, and then got positive. No, we are right now living in very uncertain times. We don't even know that is why when you get home before you enter your house, please, please protect the people. If you are coming from outside, just assume that you have come back with, with, with a, a, a positive case and just ensure you sanitize. So we are getting back into to another break. And when we come back, we shall now go through, as we finish the show, go through how soon after disease, COVID infection, should I get vaccinated? Or do I need to get vaccinated anyway? And also answer many more questions. Remember to follow us on our social media handles, The Doc Talk Show on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. You are watching The Doc Talk Show. If we get vaccinated now, observe social distancing, wear a mask properly, sanitize or wash our hands with soap and water regularly. Together we can defeat this enemy. watching the doc talk show welcome back to the doc talk show so we were discussing dr driwali how soon after someone has been infected with covid should they get vaccinated covid 19 disease disease it's a, a new disease and we're learning so many things one of the key um, concerns is when you are vaccinated uh, when you are infected how long does the natural immunity you acquire protect you? Remember, if you refuse to be vaccinated, you'll be vaccinated through the natural process of disease. And which, when you recover, you still have now the immunity which you would have acquired through an injection. 
Now, the question is, how long does the immunity acquired through infection last? There are a number of studies which give six to eight months of protection. So, in the context of uh, scarce doses of, uh, of COVID vaccines, it is safe. Our position is you get vaccinated after six months. But when you are in a high-risk uh, environment, like for health workers who have to look after others in a very infected, potentially infected settings, after three months, we will give them the doses, um, the, 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 the vaccination after that infection. Three months, yeah. Uh, so, Dr. Driwale, one of the things that has been awash in the media recently is uh, the fact that the European Union is not recognizing the COVID shield vaccine, which we have here. By the way, you know we also have the Vaxveria, yes. the 175,000 doses yes. that came later. So, we have people in Uganda who got a first dose with uh, AstraZeneca yeah. from yeah. India, which is called COVID shield, yes. and now got their second dose. Uh, with AstraZeneca from Oxford, yes, which is from, the from Sweden, uh, yes, from Sweden, which is Vaxveria. Now, so that is the one that the EU had uh, tentative that was uh, accepted by the EU, and the COVID shield not yet accepted by the EU. But before I hand over to you to tell us what this is all about, I just want to make it clear that when you hear AstraZeneca, it is AstraZeneca. When you hear Panadol, Paracetamol, Calpol. Cetamo, or whatever name it is, inside there what we have is the ingredient of paracetamol, which is the same with vaccine. If it's the AstraZeneca, the ingredient in there, irrespective of manufacturing site and manufacturer, is AstraZeneca the same thing. So, Dr. Driwale, why is the EU not recognizing Covishield that was manufactured in Serum Institute of India? You know, COVID is a new disease, and most people are operating on panic mode. And also, uh, the desire for self-preservation. EU is interested in protecting its citizens. And the measures they have put uh, was to protect uh, their, their region uh, from vac vaccines used in other countries, but focusing on more of on the vaccines which are used in their country, which are registered for use in their country. Now, I think this is an unintended effect. The consequences of that action were not their primary uh, focus. Mm -hmm. Now, as you have ably explained, the active ingredient is the same. It is the packaging which, which varies. Mm -hmm. So, what we have also seen is uh, this measure, this, this move created uh, um, a, a global concern. And um, these measures have been reconsidered. Uh, as of yesterday, about seven countries in the EU had already accepted that COVID shield uh, vaccine. People who are vaccinated with the Indian version, Indian made AstraZeneca should, can now be allowed to go into their countries. So the worry which we had at the beginning is coming to an end. I think progressively all the countries are going to accept the COVID shield to be, to be used. And therefore, those of us in Uganda who got COVID shield should feel safe that progressively these restrictions are going to go down. So these hitches happen. But also, we are also adding that uh, in the current context where we have variants, where variants are coming and predominating, and if we had enough doses, really everybody should get protected. But since we do not have enough doses, we are offering these few doses to people who are at highest risk of even getting infected with a new variant after the natural infection. So for purposes, for ethical reasons and all that, your body still has natural immunity up to six to eight months, so you can safely go up to six months without getting the vaccine. But if you have so many vaccines available, 
you can easily get your vaccine as soon as you feel uh, quite okay. Now, we also talked about Dr. Driwale. I remember in one of your presentations uh, globally, you mentioned that soon after lockdown last year, we saw a drastic drop in the number of people that of number of children getting their routine vaccinations. We wouldn't want to see an outbreak. We can now not handle a measles outbreak or a yellow fever outbreak or hepatitis B if it came right now during this pandemic. So what do you, information do you have for people out there when it comes to routine immunization, continuing with the other antigens during this lockdown and pandemic? We have responsibility uh, over people's health and especially for us, vaccine preventable diseases. If we do not pay attention to the diseases which we are already protecting using vaccines and concentrate on COVID management and COVID vaccination, then we will be, find ourselves dealing, as you have said, with more than one epidemic. And this is what uh, we are very, uh, uh, very keen about. Last year, in the month of April, during the lockdown, we saw uh, a 4% reduction in our immunization performance, which is in static locations, in health facilities. We saw 15% reduction in the numbers of children who were vaccinated during an outreach. So, in a nutshell, the lockdown impacted outreaches very severely. And maybe to, to just say the 15% represented half, 50% of children who are normally vaccinated mm -hmm. through uh, outreach uh, uh, programs. So the same is in this lockdown period, that the public should know that the responsibility to vaccinate children with the routine vaccines still exists and should continue. Take your child, get the required authorization if it is necessary, take your child to health facilities to be vaccinated. Healthcare workers are therefore reminded that the strongest pillar of our immunization program are the static uh, vaccination points. Keep them open. You are an essential service, so keep the static immunization points open for the people to move and access. Number two, where health facilities are far from the communities and with the restrictions for movement, the healthcare workers should access, take advantage of the privilege given to them to move nearer to the communities so that the communities do not move far, move on their behalf. Move nearer to the communities so that they have shorter distances to move to that outreach location and once you are at the outreach location, ensure that the numbers of people are few and also observance of SOPs during the vaccination exercise is a critical requirement. So this is the main message uh, for uh, routine immunization in the context of lockdown. Good, excellent. So the restrictions that the EU had actually put is the fact that if you did not get those four vaccines they had listed, you would be put in quarantine at arrival. They were not even saying that don't come to the EU. Mm -hmm. But just like social media is an expert at what it does, they said you will not be allowed in the EU. But also to note that AstraZeneca, the studies of AstraZeneca was first done in Oxford mm -hmm. in the UK. And the UK contracted, and sub, like how you lease, mm. India, which had the biggest manufacturing plant globally for this vaccine. And that is the reason that, for example, Africa, with our population and the number of vaccines we need, India was the best supplier we could get because of the capacity of manufacturing, not because it is less 
uh, a less, you know, a less uh, important vaccine or less useful vaccine. But it's because of the ability to manufacture, which was a vaccine, the, exactly the same vaccine that is in UK, same vaccine that is being manufactured in South Korea, same vaccine being manufactured in the USA, for, which is all AstraZeneca. Okay. I think this has been an interesting show, Dr. Driwale. It's always a pleasure because you speak like a teacher and you teach the masses. I think uh, people say that doctors are not good at teaching, but I know there are some people, maybe because of what we've been faced with, with the anti-vaxxers, the whole movement and people, and all this, and having to counter uh, these issues every time we get a new vaccine. We go through the same process. It's predictable. People will hesitate and then finally accept. So what is your parting shot to the Ugandans out there? So I have two shots. The first is that COVID-19 um, is going to be with us for a long time. And we need to prepare to live with it. And living with it requires that we comply with the SOPs, it requires that we vaccinate, and when treatment, which is uh, um, definitive, comes on board, we embrace it. The second message is that we do not want to create um, a, a situation where routine immunization goes down and we see the emergence of vaccine-preventable diseases, which we had already controlled very well, to become another outbreak. So look at the immunization status of your children. Make sure that their vaccination for routine immunization is on schedule. And I appeal to all healthcare workers to up their game and rise up to this occasion. Thank you very much, Dr. Driwale. We could not have had a better person to speak about the COVID-19 vaccination. And I would like to tell you that vaccines do work. Vaccines ended smallpox. Vaccines have ended wild polio. I'm sure while many of us were growing up, we saw lame people. I no longer see lame people on the streets, apart from people who have probably had accidents and have had... We no longer see those, what we used to see, people on their knees and people on, on sticks, you know, while growing up. Yes, we no longer see daily measles. People used to have children, six children, knowing that three, two or three will die of measles. And this is all because of vaccines. So please, vaccines do work. Embrace this vaccination campaign. Everybody has a moral obligation to society to transmit the right information. The educated, ignorant people who send out the wrong information? You just need to repent. Vaccines do work. As the program manager mentioned, we need to be together in ending this pandemic. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Driwale, program manager, Uganda National Expanded Program on Immunization. And I still remain Dr. Fiona Tewe, a vaccinologist and immunization specialist. The Doc Talk Show. Up next on UBC, brought to you by... Keep the lights on. Use Airtel money to pay for all your Yaka bills conveniently.